Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are going to spend the next hour and a half talking about a lot of things that are COVID related um, when it comes to the federal funds that you have received um, over the past six weeks or so. Um, our presenters today are going to be Joy Feige, who is a partner in our Sioux Falls, South Dakota office. Joy is the chair of our firm's Single Audit Technical Issues Committee. She has over 30 years of experience working um, in public accounting and has spent a large portion of that time working with not-for-profit organizations and not-for-profit organizations that receive and expend federal funds. So one of our uh, firm experts in this industry. Um, our second main presenter today is Kurt Schlicker. Kurt is a senior manager in our Reno, Nevada office and is a member also of our firm's technical issues committee for single audits. Kurt's experience uh, with the single audit environment is primarily in the government space, working on state audits and counties and um, local governments. So he's going to bring some flavor to the day from the government perspective. And my name is Angie Hillestead. I'm a partner in Ide Bailey's National Assurance Office. I do a whole variety of things um, in the not-for-profit and single audit realm, and I'll be assisting Joy and Kurt today uh, with moderating some questions and um, kind of keeping things on, on track here. Today we have a lot of information to talk to you about, and we're happy to be here with you today. Um, we're going to start out by talking kind of a, a general overview of the various programs that have federal funds being passed through to not-for-profits and government agencies um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the responses in trying to make sure that everything keeps up and running um, during this uncertain time. And we want to touch on those funds, but also how that might impact you if you have to have a single audit um, because you have received those funds from the federal government. We're going to talk about the volume of questions that are still out there. I think what you're going to hear today us say a lot is, we don't know, but we think. Um, and the reason we don't know a lot of concrete answers is there are a lot of questions that are still circling. So we're going to spend some time talking about questions that the Government Audit Quality Center of the AICPA um, provided to the Office of Management and Budget to try to get some clarification on some things going on that we just don't have the answers to yet. We want to talk about the internal control environment and how you want to make sure that your internal controls are in place over um, the expending of these grant funds so that whatever kind of audit you need to end up having, you are ready to have that. And we're going to talk about some specific compliance challenges and recommendations for both nonprofits and governments. So what are the things that we think that you are really going to be challenged with as you try to make sure that you are covering all your bases with the use of these grant funds? And then time permitting, uh, we are going to try to answer your questions. I want to caveat that by saying there's a lot of information to get through today. So if we do run out of time, um, the Zoom feature does allow us to track those questions and we will uh, respond to you individually offline, but we'll try to get through as much of that information as we can. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joy and Kurt to get us started. All right, thank you so much for the introduction, Angie, and uh, I think today um, through the this Zoom meeting and this remote workforce, and it's amazing what we can do with technology today. So to, to kick things off, just as a general overview, we realize that there are a lot of programs available under the CARES Act. We're not going to cover every single one under the sun because we'd be here for today and tomorrow just trying to cover all the nuances of all of them. We are going to talk specifically um, a little bit about the PPP loan program under the SBA, uh, not so much the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, EIDL. Those are two probably of the, the more common ones. We will talk about PPP specifically, but we're also going to talk about other supplemental relief. So we are going to talk about supplemental funding. We are going to talk about PPP. The total intent 
intent of today's presentation is to talk about commonalities between them, how they're gonna interact, and controls and compliance requirements that you know share common characteristics for organizations to prepare as a whole. Now, some of these programs may be subject to single audit. For those of you on the line who have never had a single audit before, because many nonprofits are now getting new funding and may exceed that uh, $750,000 in federal financial assistance, a single audit is required when federal financial assistance does exceed 750,000 for its fiscal year. And federal financial assistance does include loans, loan guarantees, interest subs subsidies, um, other things like forgiveness. Those will potentially be and, and required to be recorded on a schedule of expenditures of federal awards and would then subject the organization to a single audit. We do expect an increase in major programs, an increase in audit burden. The future impact on audit costs, you know, are, are not quite known, but just just be aware that, you know, we wanted to bring to attention that there is expected to be an increase in audit burden um, because of all these new new programs coming out. So a big disclaimer before we start, there has been no guidance received from the OMB yet as to whether any of these programs under the CARES Act will be subject to single audit requirements. We don't know whether they'll be subject to single audit or other specific audits or something more focused. So our intent with today is to prepare organizations conservatively for just in case there is a single audit required. Most of these are best practices, good internal controls and good stewardship. So it's, it's not really going to harm the organization by preparing conservatively and implementing these types of uh, recommendations uh, whether or not a single audit is required. There is also the caveat of supplemental funding. We are aware that many organizations are, have re received uh, increases to current awards. Specifically, you know, I think of grants like Title I, where has received a lot of additional funding under the CARES Act if they're already identified with a, with a known CFDA, that's the identifier from the Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance. But if they're already identified with the CFDA, those will be recorded on the CFA. Those will be subject to audit, just like any other normal uh, CFDA or federal grant program. So again, we're going to go over uh, the GAQC questions and, and other items in just a minute to, to get more details on this, but that's just a disclaimer before we get into the meat and potatoes today. Okay, as Kurt indicated in the previous slides, there's several different forms of relief available and a lot of unknowns until additional guidance is received. And so I'm going to just uh, provide a recap here from the nonprofit perspective of what we view um, or what we have identified so that you can have these items on your radar, design your cash flow strategies and operational strategies accordingly. So what really are the risks, challenges, and concerns as it relates to nonprofit organizations and the relief uh, programs currently rolled out? Uh, really what we see as a challenge um, is the fact that these relief programs didn't really contemplate the interplay between the grants funded employees and the requirements of the programs. Um, in a minute, Kurt's going to recap the OMB memos, but basically there were some memos that were issued that provided some directions, um, direction to agencies that indicated that if you have a grant funded employee, you could continue to charge the grant for their time, even in a lockdown or stay at home period where they're not necessarily performing the typical functions of the grant. The PPP loan, however, was designed to provide relief for payroll. But the caveat is, is that you can't be reimbursed for payroll by both the grant and the PPP funds. 
So if you're a heavily funded grant entity and when you go to determine your forgiveness on your PPP loan, you can't necessarily exclude those grant funded employees from your calculation or you will fail um, what's referred to as the 75% rule, meaning they're expecting you to use 75% of the PPP loan for payroll costs during that eight week period. And banks aren't necessarily understanding the relationship either between a grant funded component, um, grant funded employees and how that um, impacts your forgiveness and the risk of what we refer to as double dipping of costs, uh, meaning you're getting reimbursed by, the, by two different funding sources for the same dollars. The PPP loan isn't really the only concern or issue here. Um, we will be mentioning others, uh, but that is a fairly significant concern from our standpoint, and we'll be discussing that throughout the presentation. If you're a nonprofit that um, hasn't typically received federal financial assistance, um, as Kurt mentioned, that will maybe now trigger a single audit as a result of these funds, or uh, you may be receiving supplemental funds that will put you over the threshold. So as a result, does your organization need to get policies and procedures documented and, and in place? Um, to be prepared in time for a single audit. We're going to be talking a lot about tracking and at a high level, what we mean by tracking um, is assigning your individual costs to the various funding sources. If your organizations have grants now, uh, you likely have a process in place and you will be able to just redesign or supplement um, your current process of tracking costs. Um, however, if you are new to tracking, um, you will need to be establishing processes to uh, be able to ensure that you are assigning your costs to the funding sources. We're also going to be talking about internal controls and, and the risks related to your organization as it relates to those internal controls. How have your internal controls changed during this time frame, and what are your organizational risks? And then lastly, we'll be talking about budget amendments. Um, because of the change in either cash flow strategies with the availability of the PPP loans and other fundings that may potentially be covering other costs, uh, a budget amendment might be appropriate. Or maybe it's simply because your costs have changed. Perhaps you now have a significant increase in protective clothing for your employees or equipment or additional cleaning services that your current grant budgets uh, weren't contemplating at the time the budgets were made. So that's what um, we would like to hit on from a nonprofit perspective today throughout the presentation. And many of you listening to Joy um, may be thinking, okay, that's great. That's the nonprofit impact of SBA programs and we're aware of the PPP and EIDL programs, but how does that impact a government? Well, I want you to realize that it will impact governments uh, mainly because a lot of nonprofits are subrecipients of governments. And so there are going to be oversight and considerations of how those SBA programs or those programs that your nonprofit subrecipients are receiving are going to impact and, and coincide with the other grant programs and funding sources that you may already provide. One of them may be indirect costs. We're gonna spend a lot of time, well, at least some time going over indirect costs and how negotiated indirect cost rate plans may need to change to avoid duplicating costs between PPP and what the indirect rate was already calculating. Joy talked about budget amendment requests. 
well, if, if your subrecipients are going to be asking for budget amendments, then conversely on the government side, you're going to need to be processing those budget amendment requests, reviewing them, uh, understanding the allowable costs and, and, and what can be charged to the grant. So even though, again, it's going to be your, the nonprofits heavily um, applying for these budget amendment requests, it will hit you as a government too. And of course, if, if you're doing the same thing going upwards to the feds and you're asking for budget amendment requests at a government level, you'll have it at both the subrecipient side and the monitoring and directly to your federal grantor. So again, just keep in mind that the SBA programs, although they're the PPP and EIDL are, are directly benefiting you know, nonprofits in the single audit setting, they will impact governments. Joy mentioned earlier the OMB memos and, and what these were is that the Office of Management and Budget, they issued two mem memos earlier this spring to other federal agencies. And when I'm talking about federal agencies, the Health and Human Services, Education, you know, Justice, the big federal agencies, and it was a direction to allow agencies to adopt allowable waivers and, and essentially bring them into their own policies to allow their grant recipients basically administrative relief. And we're going to talk about some payroll waivers and potentially matching waivers reporting. But in essence, it was, it was meant to allow federal agencies to provide administrative relief to each of their grantees. Now, it wasn't a universal, the one thing I want to stress is it wasn't a universal waiver to all grantees. It's, it's by federal agency. Most federal agencies were relatively consistent in how they adopted the waivers and, and the allowable exceptions in the, in the OMB memos, but not every agency was exactly the same. So if you deal a lot with education grants, you need to be looking at the education adoption of the memos. If you work in health and human services, you need to look towards that adoption. If you work in an organization that has many different federal agencies, unfortunately, you're going to have to look at each federal agency for the appropriate direction. Now, I did mention they were relatively consistent in general, so I don't think there's any major um, incongruity between the federal agencies, but there are some nuances that you will have to keep in mind as you uh, try to receive guidance and implement any allowable waivers. So as a result of the OMB memos and all of the new funding sources, the Government Audit Quality Center of the AICPA actually did prepare a nine-page letter on April 10th identifying various concerns and requesting direction and clarification of these issues. And this is a visual uh, just to help you out, uh, just to get you an idea of what the letter consists of. Um, we actually have a link to the actual letter on the resources tab at the end of the presentation if you're interested in reading the letter. Really the concern here is that many of you likely have June 30 fiscal year ends. And so from a timing perspective, uh, due to the timing of when this is happening, we don't have a lot of time to address all of the uncertainties. Um, on the next slide, I'm just going to walk you through a few of the issues that were highlighted in the letter. And so we've already kind of hit on the, the biggest unknown, which is what programs are actually subject to the single audit requirements. Um, some of the more, more unusual or less familiar assistance programs like the employee retention credit or the election to defer employer uh, payroll taxes, uh, will those be subject to single audit and required to be shown on your schedule of federal expenditures. And in the case of the deferred payroll taxes, in what year would those be shown and be subject to testing? 
Are they subject to testing under the accrual basis of accounting? Uh, in the year that they actually were incurred or would they be subject to testing in the year they were actually paid and you were reimbursed for those payroll taxes by your grantor. And then uh, the letter also talked about will for-profits be subject to some kind of program specific or other um, kind of audit uh, relating to this type of funding. It really wouldn't be equitable if only nonprofits were scrutinized and all the for-profit entities were not scrutinized. And we are aware that on Tuesday, uh, there was some guidance that came out that said that if your PPP loan is greater than $2 million, you will be subject to a full SBA audit prior to the loan being forgiven. Um, however, we are waiting for clarification as to what exactly a full SBA, SBA audit consists of and who would be performing uh, the actual audit uh, in that case. Assuming there will, these programs will be subject to single audit requirements, uh, the letter also talked about, you know, what currently there was no CFDA number and a CFDA number is the government's way of cataloging uh, types of systems by assigning a number. There was no CFDA number assigned. Are, are they going to be using existing CFDA numbers? Are they going to assign new CFDA numbers to this uh, relief? Will all of the COVID relief be clustered together and tested as one program? Uh, back when there was um, ARA funding, they required separate identification of the ARA funding on the CIFA. Will the COFA COVID funding be the same where we have to separately identify it on the CIFA? So those are some of the impacts to the actual schedule itself. Um, but there, there will also be a risk assessment impact. And for those of you that are new to single audit requirements, there's certain thresholds based on the total federal financial assistance that you receive. If you receive less than 25 million of federal assistance, the threshold is 750,000 for type A programs and any programs less than 750,000 are, are referred to as type B programs. Assuming all of this will be subject to single audit we definitely see uh, increase in type A high risk programs. And we would likely, just due to the lack of guidance, it's a new program, the opportunity in a remote work environment of abuse, those type B programs would also be deemed high risk and then potentially be subject to testing as well. So again, uh, Kurt referred to potential increased audit costs and, and that risk assessment would be a direct uh, factor in that consideration as far as what we would be required to be tested. Another huge question from our perspective as the auditors is uh, what changes are going to be made to the compliance supplement. So the compliance supplement is a tool that we rely on for, uh, fairly heavily and auditees also rely on it. It basically is our roadmap from the federal agencies as far as what's required to be tested, what does the federal agencies see as significant areas that they want us to focus on. So that compliance supplement is typically issued in June each year. Well, due again to the timing of this, the COVID-19, um, when will the compliance supplement be released and, and how soon so that we can all prepare if you have a June 30 year end? And then will the AICPA um, is actually asking for some consistency across federal agencies because as Kurt mentioned, those memos actually gave the agencies quite a bit of discretion. And so if 
all federal agencies are allowed to decide what they do or don't want tested, it will be very challenging for both the entities being audited and the auditors. Uh, the last thing that I would like to hit on as far as the GAQC letter is internal controls and findings. So there's kind of three stages here that we see that could potentially impact your internal control structure. You obviously had the pre-COVID-19 processes in place. And then due to uh, the, the COVID-19 situation, we have the during COVID-19 where you're in the remote uh, workforce um, stage. So your internal controls or your key controls likely changed. And then hopefully we'll return to normal and be able to get back to the pre-COVID-19 state. But that obviously won't happen overnight. It will be a gradual process. So currently auditors identify key controls that are assigned to various compliance requirements and we're required to test those key controls uh, based on minimum sample size guidance that we are provided with the, by the AICPA. If the key control changes, then we need to select a separate sample and test the new key control. So the letter is asking about really, what is the expectation from a testing standpoint? Are we going to be able, if there's actually three key controls in your fiscal year, will we be required to test three times as many transactions as what we have typically in the past in a year when there was only one key control throughout the year. How does that impact our testing? And then they're also asking for clarification as to what the federal um, agencies are going to expect or how they're going to react if there are internal control findings in the during COVID-19 stage. And so those are um, some pretty big concerns from an internal control standpoint, a lot of unknowns out there. And so we'll be talking more about internal controls to try to make sure that you are prepared for for any of the future guidance that's coming. You know, some additional items in that GAQC letter and, and more than just the applicability of single audit and internal controls, they also touched on different compliance requirements. Again, some of these we will talk about in detail um, in just a few minutes, but allowable costs, the GAQC specifically was concerned about payroll, indirect costs and other allowable costs and credits that are a result of the CARES program or in direct response to COVID-19. Again, payroll with a remote workforce, time and effort reporting, you know, those were, were major concerns. Indirect costs I, I touched upon earlier with double dipping and the interplay between the PPP program and other grant programs. For cash management, there's, there is a large concern here on the distribution of funds and timing. A lot of these relief programs, especially the ones to state and local governments, where we're talking uh, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars are, are being dispersed to states and local governments for then distribution, uh, depending on, on you know, their governors uh, or their counties' uh, managers' decision-making. You know, these funds are being advanced, and when we typically think about cash management in a grant setting, normally it's a reimbursement basis or for immediate cash needs. And typically immediate cash needs is defined as 10 days. And when states are getting billions of dollars, it's pretty hard to come up with a game plan on how to disperse all of that within 10 days, um, especially to agencies who may not have those costs yet. You know, we all recognize that there's a lot of lost revenue out there, but there might not be a billion dollars in additional costs depending on the type of, of entity that you are. And so there is an ask for clarification on, you know, what type of impact on cash management compliance will there be when 
billions of dollars are advanced. It won't be for immediate cash needs in some cases, and it won't be on a reimbursement basis in some cases. Matching, many, many uh, organizations across the country are asking for a waiver of local match. And for those of you who, who don't know what match is, match is essentially a, a built-in mechanism into grants where the, the federal government says, we'll give you $100, but for every $100, you have to kick in a certain portion, $25, $30, whatever that is, and it varies by grant. And many agencies and organizations are asking for relief from match uh, during the pandemic. Waiver of that local match is, is essentially a grant by grant um, determination or an agency by federal agency determination. So again, the GAQC is asking for clarification on that and uh, whether or not there's any impl implications on compliance. Procurement, suspension and debarment. Procurement during a emergency and in a, in a state of emergency is a different animal than procurement, you know, during normal operations. There's lots of questions regarding emergency purchasing, sole source purchasing, or non-competitive um, purchases. We're going to cover procurement in detail a little bit later, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it here. But there are, are questions about procurement and what do nonprofits and governments need to do and how to respond and how should the auditors uh, test procurement. Reporting, these dollars came out of Congress so quickly and they're, and they're just you know, being signed into law and they're, and they're being dispersed. And a lot of the terms and conditions that, that we're reading as auditors that we're seeing is, you know, there will be special reporting required on this funding to be determined at a later date. So obviously that's not very clear either for an auditor or an auditee, what types of special reporting requirements will be required to be tested. You know, in many cases, auditors are required to test reports, but we look at the objective information, you know, something that we can verify and test back to source records. Will these special reports be objective or will they be, you know, more narrative in nature? We're, we're not quite sure what kind of uh, data elements will have to be reported. Again, all of those are real unknowns right now. For subrecipients, are there gonna be different requirements at a prime level or a subrecipient level? How will the impact of any of these programs and funding sources, will there be different compliance requirements depending on whether you're at a prime or, or a subrecipient level? And then the catch-all is special tests. You know, special tests is, has historically been the federal agency's way of, of covering very specific compliance requirements that don't fit into the others, so to speak. And so it's, again, unclear right now of what special tests there will be, you know, what will be in, included in the compliance supplement and what the auditor expectation for some of these special tests will be. Joy did mention earlier, there is a link to um, the GOQC letter in our resources page. There is also a link to the OMB memo uh, that I covered a little bit earlier. If, if you're curious and you wanna see the memo on the direction for potential waivers to federal agencies, but just keep in mind again that that was a direction to federal agencies and not just a universal waiver for grantees. Okay, we're gonna cover internal control and compliance considerations next. And this is, again, a demonstration of what I was referring to earlier with the three potential stages or, or various systems of internal controls. So the pre-COVID-19 is the obvious, what, what we were all used to, the standard operating procedures. They're in writing. You have full staffing levels, everyone knows what their job responsibilities are um, in a non-remote workforce where they have access to the, the payroll time clock and all the other tools um, that the office uh, provides to us. And then once we enter into the COVID-19 declared emergency stage, um, all of that kind of got turned upside down. And what we're used to is no longer um, available to us. 
And so now you might have reduced staffing levels, your staff that is working um, or trying to work in the remote workforce out of their home might not have access to the tools, the payroll time clock, um, the electronic approval process that maybe your system has in place. And so you need to be very careful in the remote setting about transferring information via email from a security standpoint. Um, you don't want to be emailing payroll information or any other kind of uh, personal identifying information through email and approving things that way. And potentially you don't have a secure portal system set up. So all of those are concerns during the COVID-19 period. So kind of what are the expectations or what is sufficient level of documentation during that time? We've We've been getting that question quite a bit. And are the requirements going to be more lenient? And if so, how much more? And so I think here, just uh, common sense, do your best. Um, if you, for example, if you don't have an electronic approval process in place, uh, default to the email approvals, but obviously, again, do not include, um, include secure information within those emails. At a very minimum, if you are to a reduced staffing level and you don't have the opportunity to have a secondary review or approval process in place, you're the individual doing the transaction from start to finish. Document why the approval process wasn't possible at the time and then obtain retro approval as a compensating control uh, once you hit that post COVID-19 stage. There's also an argument out there for the need for internal control findings during this um, COVID-19 stage where we're, we're all working remotely. For example, are they really relevant internal control findings? Are they relevant for future years? I mean, we are all hopeful we don't have to relive the current situation. Isn't the real concern here that the dollars are being spent for their intended purpose? And shouldn't the focus really be on compliance testing? And then what is your corrective action plan going to say as a response if you have internal control findings during this time frame? And our federal agencies how are they going to view any internal control findings? Typically, if you have findings, the federal agency that has an impact or could have an impact on your future funding, but in this situation, do the federal agencies even care um, due to the situation? So those are all things to think about, but then I would also challenge you as you return to the post COVID-19 stage, what did you actually learn from this experience? Are there, is there any efficiencies that you've learned? Can you streamline your process and make things easier for your organization or less cumbersome where the control still exists, but it can be accomplished in a much easier fashion? So those are three of the um, stages of internal control. I think the opposite side of the argument about who cares about internal controls during COVID-19 is that from an organizational risk perspective and minimizing your risk to the entity and protecting yourself, if you're the one that's in charge of dispersing these funds from federal scrutiny, we would argue that internal controls during COVID-19 are more important than ever, simply really because of the very large dollar amounts that we're talking about. There's new grants or funding sources with very little or unclear guidance at this point. You're in the remote working environment. There's lots of pressures on cash flow, 
financial pressures individually and organizationally. So the potential for fraud and abuse is much higher in the current situation. Also, um, it's just appropriate fiduciary responsibility to spend these funds for their intended purpose, um, either taking care of your own employees so that they can retain their jobs and their paychecks and fulfilling the mission of your uh, grant or purpose of your organization or governmental entity for the public good. So for those reasons, we argue that internal controls are still very important um, and for the organization's uh, protection. So I had mentioned tracking and how you would potentially track costs. Um, it's very, it, this is a very important decision if you have not yet made a determination on how best to track your relief funds that you've received. Um, we're gonna talk about a couple different methods, but first of all, for loans, so PPP loan or other federal loans, we are recommending that you set up a separate general ledger account for the liability side and a separate general ledger account for the restricted cash side for the proceeds. We've heard mixed um, conflicting guidance about whether you need a physical cash account that segregates your PPP loans. Uh, so we do not have an answer to that. From a general ledger perspective, we are recommending segregating those. And then as you um, assign costs to various funding pools, you could release those uh, restriction, restricted cash into your unrestricted cash. From a grant perspective, um, there's various ways you can track costs. And again, by tracking costs, we're meaning assigning certain expenses to the funding that it's intended to uh, relate to. So you could either set up new classes in QuickBooks. Uh, a lot of nonprofits use QuickBook classes to track funding sources. Maybe your general ledger has project code capabilities or task orders or potentially sub general ledger accounts. Um, you could potentially track COVID costs on a spreadsheet if, if you're not a very large organization and you only have a few funding sources. Uh, but the key here is that you need to be able to link the spreadsheet to where those costs are recorded within your general ledger because that will need to be known you'll need to be able to identify where those costs are recorded in your general ledger. The disadvantage of using spreadsheets is that the risk of accidentally duplicating costs is greater because you don't have that direct link unless you're, you design your spreadsheets to be integrated so that they can't duplicate any costs. Document retention here is key, we believe. It's an environment of a lot of unknowns. So document the dates, the times, who you talk to, what federal agencies um, you've reached out for guidance. If they don't respond to your request, because they're going to have a very large volume of requests, you know, document when you followed up. Um, proceed using your best judgment, documenting your justification as to why you feel you could proceed accordingly. If you've received waivers for reporting deadlines or matching percentages, um, any of those types of waivers, whether you're relying on the uh, federal agency's guidance, document, um, those considerations. And then lastly, you really need to communicate throughout the organization uh, so that everyone is aware of the terms and conditions or as aware of 
the terms and conditions as they can be as they're distributed um, and the allowable uses of the funds in the environment you know whether it's intentional or unintentional uh, there's there's risks involved so you want to make sure everyone is is aware of the requirements uh, so that uh, there is no mis misunderstandings so internal controls being aware of your organizational risk from a nonprofit standpoint i mentioned this earlier but we're just going to reiterate it whether it's intentional or unintentional we see the duplication of costs across funding sources just because of the mass confusion of the different options and the lack of guidance um, to be a significant risk we also see cash flow increased pressure on restricted resources so perhaps your funding source isn't getting you the cash flow that you need in a timely manner or as timely as you are used to receiving it perhaps your program service revenue has experienced decreases and you don't have your cash typical cash flow coming in the door so kind of if you remember the three the fraud triangle there's opportunity pressure and rationalization and opportunity exists because of the remote work setting um, the pressures are there because of the cash flow concerns and the future unknowns as far as how long this is going to last and what the impacts are going to be you have minimum reduced staffing levels in some case so you really need to again reiterating that internal control protect your organization from those opportunities and financial uh, pressures and so as joy just mentioned and did such a great job going over those risks there they, they were organized under nonprofits but I you know it's important that those are also applicable to governments those aren't just a nonprofit risk they're also a governmental risk but there are a couple of you know more specific governmental risks that that I wanted to talk about and and just you know to, to get you thinking about do you have this risk is it a risk factor at at your government or your organization if you're at a larger nonprofit it, it may also be a risk but if we think about larger governments and department heads not that it necessarily is it might be a malicious intent but department heads tend to want to protect the budget and the budget authority of their department they see it as protecting their department protecting the staff and the resources of their department. So there may be instances where department heads are attempting to immediately spend down the rest of the available budget, um, doing this out of fear for future budget cuts, you know, who knows what's gonna happen next year, next fiscal year, or what budget cuts may come in the last two months of the, of the fiscal year. So again, maybe not necessarily a malicious attempt, but if you are, a decision maker in your government and or in, or in the central operations of your government you need to be aware um, of that risk that department heads maybe you know have that fear and are trying to spend down available resources when the current strategy for your organization may be to re-examine the budget and and discuss whether there needs to be freezes or modifications i'm guessing there are going to be modifications and then putting uh, internal controls in place to manage that risk. Supporting your subrecipients appropriately. Again, this is a uh, partnership. If you're a government and you're passing through funds to a subrecipient, you really should be um, in a partnership with that other organization attempting to uh, deliver on the grant and, and meet the terms and conditions of the grant and the grant objectives. You're serving the public good. So, there is a risk and, and realize that your subrecipients are also struggling. There's a lack of information on, on all, all sides and it's a very anxious time for everyone. So what kind of risks and, and risk factors are there for approving subrecipient reimbursement requests? Are those truly reimbursed costs? Are they for immediate cash needs? Are they revenue replacement? 
What kind have uh, technical support are you providing to your subrecipients and training and, and assistance? So all of that interplays and you need to have a, an analysis of those risk factors. And, and of course, if, you know, they might be different risks for different subrecipients, but you need to examine your individual case appropriately and determine the best way to proceed. There is likely going to be an increased volume of transactions and activity. Um, I know this is super specific, but if you look at unemployment insurance across the nation, think about the increased volume that unemployment insurance has across the country. There's other grants that will also have an increase in volume. And does your government or your organization have the infrastructure in place to process all that activity? And if it doesn't, and you're gonna start outsourcing it or sending it to other departments in your agency, what types of internal control processes are being followed? What type of document retention is there? So again, from an infrastructure standpoint, are you managing the risk um, that comes along with an increase in, in volume or activity? And again, many larger governments may have decentralized accounting operations where yes, they have a controller's office or, or equivalent that is centralized, but there's accountants and department heads at decentralized operations that are making decisions, uh, spending down budget, uh, and what risks from a grant setting or from a relief funding standpoint are there when you have multiple decision makers across the organization. So again, risks and internal controls, they go hand in hand. Internal controls should be attempting to manage those risks and, and think about these situations if you haven't already and how they impact your organization. One of the, so we've talked about internal controls at nauseum now, so now we're gonna talk about um, some of the specifics of the compliance requirements. And probably the most common question that we have received as a firm is, is time and effort tracking still required? So the OMB memo uh, was published and came out, and in that memo, they allowed federal agencies to provide a waiver to still pay employees who are being sent home and grant activities are closed or affected by the shutdown. So many kind of then took the next step or, or leap to say, okay, well then we don't need to track time and effort. And that's um, unfortunately not the case. What that memo was, was trying to say and iterate is that if an organization has an unexpected or extraordinary um, leave policy, then you can pay them consistent with that policy and charge that to the grant. Very similar to something like a fringe benefit. If we think about in normal circumstances and fringe benefits with uh, vacation or sick leave or, or other types of benefits, they're normally charged the grant on whatever historical allocation there's been for time spent. So if your employee works 75% of the time on the grant and 25% on non-grant activities, there many of their fringe benefits are also allocated on that 75-25 split. So what this waiver was saying is, if it's consistent with your organization's policy to pay employees who are sent home during an extraordinary circumstance like this, yes, you can charge that to the grant. Some federal agencies recognized and realized that not every organization would have an extraordinary circumstance leave policy. And so some agencies, uh, for example, Department of Education, are allowing the creation of those policies immediately so that your organization can, can write them, get them approved, get them implemented, so that you're not hung up on the administrative requirement of not having the policies. But again, that is what the memo was, was trying to provide. It wasn't saying that you don't have to track time and effort. One additional caveat is if you had an employee who was 100% grant funded and you know, their one FTE or multiple FTEs were supported in the, in the budget of the grant, and now they are sent home um, or just are still working but cannot work on the grant activities anymore, 
if you reallocate their time or their job duties to start working on non-grant activities, then they still need to be tracking that allocation of time spent because they're now supporting the organization and now they have job duties that are non-grant related. So you can't claim those non-grant job activities towards the grant. So that's very consistent with how the allocation of time spent has been in the past. And, and remember, it's not based on budget, it's based on actual time spent. Okay, so when we think about payroll now and, and after the time and effort reporting, but if we think about it from a nonprofit standpoint, there's the inclusion of the CARES Act programs, right? PPP and all the other programs. There's also the payroll tax consideration. As Joy mentioned earlier, there is a, the potential to elect a deferral of payroll taxes. So when we think about claiming those costs, if your grant operates on a reimbursement basis, you actually haven't spent any money for those payroll taxes yet because you've deferred paying that liability. However, for GAAP accounting purposes, you've recorded an expense and a liability. So now when you're claiming reimbursement, if you're just downloading your GL to claim the expenses, not all of those expenses have been paid. Now again, we are waiting for GOQC and OMB clarification on the expectation of, of the deferred um, tax program and, and their implications on compliance. But in the meantime, you need to be thinking about that and if you're claiming reimbursement for those costs that you're not paying. We talked about time and effort reporting in a remote workforce. So one of the challenges is if you're an organization that has employees physically clock in and out, and now you can't do that anymore because everyone's working from home, you need to create subsidiary records, whether that is on some sort of new software package or just through Excel. You need to create a subsidiary record. One of the one of the allowability cost provisions for payroll is that records be maintained and be incorporated into the official records of the organization to allow them to be charged. So yes, that might mean you have employees track their time spent on Excel and you incorporate them in as time cards and as official records of the organization, but, but those are the compliance steps that you need to, to go to to be able to support the payroll charge. There's also the cash flow consideration and the allowability in trying to maximize reimbursement between the PPP program and the other grants and other supplemental funding sources. If your grants are being charged and, you, and they're largely payroll funded, you need to pay attention to that 75% payroll rule under the PPP program. And if you're not gonna meet the 75% rule, you may be wanting to charge uh, payroll costs to PPP versus your grant. Again, we talked about budget amendments earlier and the need for that. We're going to talk about indirect costs next, and that also has an implication on cash flow and PPP. But if you haven't started running your cash flow models and looking at how indirect costs, your other grants, and PPP all interplay, you need to try to try to start modeling this out and trying to maximize your reimbursement while still being compliant. Now, if you have no idea where to start on that, uh, I Bailey is more than willing to help out. We do have tools available. Contact your local I Bailey representative and, and we can help walk through uh, some of the cash flow modeling and the PPP tools that, that we have available. Just, you know, if, if you haven't or if you're struggling with that um, currently. From a governmental perspective, you know, I talked about there, there's potential for a large change in job duties for many employees. You know, some employees may be getting pulled from their normal job duties to process checks just because they don't have enough infrastructure for the increased volume or support, you know, a health and human services program that they may have not supported earlier. Or their grant is shut down currently and what they were normally working on they can't be working on anymore and they've been reassigned to some other job duty. What's real particular about governments is everyone focuses on the budget 
And so when you have employees that are changing job duties, it, the budget and where that time is charged is not always, you know, thought of in, in an emergency situation. But again, keep in mind that budget's not an allowable um, allocation to, to ultimately charge costs. It can be done in the interim and in the meantime, but there always has to be a true up at the end to make sure that it's based on actual time spent. So now thinking about indirect costs, and the reason we've brought it up many times, and maybe many of you are wondering why we keep bringing up indirect costs, typically how an indirect cost rate plan works is an indirect cost pool is determined where all your central service costs, you know, things like admin costs, IT support, you know, maybe public works, whatever it is, some, all those central service costs, they are accumulated in indirect cost rate pools and then ultimately divided by direct costs to come up with an indirect cost rate that is basically an estimate of indirect costs. Then that rate is applied to the direct costs for your grant and then, and then you're reimbursed for your estimate of indirect costs. Now that's an indirect cost rate. There's also cost allocation where those, instead of being divided by direct cost, they would be allocated based on uh, reasonable measures. Now, where it gets tricky with the PPP is many of those central service costs and those payroll costs may now be um, paid with the PPP loan program. So that means they're now direct costs to PPP and are no longer an indirect cost. So if they're included in your indirect cost rate pool, whether it's used for the division method or for the all for cost allocation, those would now be duplicated costs and you would be double dipping between indirect and direct, which is unallowable. So that obviously causes a lot of heartache and headache for both nonprofits and governments, both sides, because they have negotiated indirect cost rates that now either need to be completely re-examined or renegotiated. Now, the OMB did allow in the memo for use of a previous rate. So if, you're, if you need to renegotiate your indirect cost rate or it's been delayed and you need to re-examine it, whatever the case may be, you can default back to the previous rate until the new rate is determined and then do a true up later. But when we think about compliance and, and both from an auditor side and an auditee side, if you have an indirect cost rate plan you need to be examining that now to make sure that you are that those indirect costs are still being treated as indirect across all your funding sources. If any of those is, have flipped to now a direct cost, they need to be removed and adjusted out of out of your indirect cost rate plan. We did talk about other allowable costs earlier for both nonprofits and governments. The OMB memo did provide that agencies can allow for directly responsible COVID-19 um, costs. And, and what that means is, let's say you had a conference or some sort of travel or training or some event or some sort of grant activity that was closed or canceled and you had an increased cost that is related to the grant but as a result of COVID-19. Those direct costs, as long as they're identifiable and related to the grant, can be charged to the grant. Now, of course, this may um, require budget amendments and, and discussion between your grantor and, and whether there's supplemental funding to increase the level of funding so that you're not blowing through your budget on these other COVID costs. All of those are, of course, considerations. But keep in mind that if you have grants that have um, COVID related costs and, and it can be stuff like a, a closure or cancellation of travel, those may be allowable. All right, procurement. Again, probably the, the, probably the second most common question we get is, we're in an emergency situation, we can use the non-competitive purchasing exemption, correct? And the, the real answer is it depends. So the OMB memo, the only exceptions that the OMB memo gave were 
potential waivers of geographical preferences and the disadvantaged business program, recognizing uh, the administrative difficulties of the disadvantaged business program and the need to sometimes just use local vendors immediately in an emergency situation. Though those were the only two waivers um, provided. It was not a waiver on suspending document retention, suspending uh, competitive bidding, all of those. However, depending on your grant, geographical region or, or you know, the intended purchase, there still may be a public exigency, right? There still may be public health considerations. It may still be an emergency purchase. If it's an emergency purchase, then you can use the non-competitive purchasing exemption. Each agency should have purchasing policies that um, govern what to do in an emergency situation. You would follow those emergency purchases. Many of you may be saying, well, our emergency purchase policy says we don't have to do any competitive bidding. And I guess I would challenge you on that, that is the purchase of something like copier paper as an example, something that is, um, you know, an emergency for public health. Again, each grant may be different, each purchase may be different. So that's why it depends on whether non-competitive purchasing is allowable exemption or not. So I did mention um, emergency situations are, are required to follow emergency procurement policies. The, the problem with that or the hurdle is that many organizations, especially if you've never been subject to a single audit before, but even if you have, many organizations are missing emergency purchase policies. So what is the required step? What's the recommendation on the purchasing guidelines and what to follow during that situation? And, and really the best advice that we can give as an auditor is to reach out to your grantor directly if you don't have emergency purchasing policies and ask for them you know, what guidance and what to follow. There is a non-competitive exemption under um, the uniform guidance that if your grantor has provided authorization to proceed non-competitively, that that's an allowable exemption. So you just need to, you need to communicate, you need to talk with your grantor and, and discuss this if you do not have emergency purchasing policies. Suspension and debarment, unfortunately, in times of emergency, whether they're FEMA natural disasters or our current pandemic, there's a lot of people that wanna do a lot of good and work together and, and where we as humans come together. But unfortunately, there's also those individuals that look to take advantage of situations like that and um, act unethically, fraud, waste, and abuse. There's large opportunity for that in an emergency situation. So you still can't, you know, as you're going through your contracting and you're going through your processes, you still need to have very strong controls and checks on suspension and debarment. Because remember, vendors and, and people generally only get on the suspension and debarment list for acting unethically. And they're, you know, they're the types of people that would potentially take advantage of a situation like this. So you need to be protecting yourself and your organization and making sure that you're still following suspension and debarment uh, checks and not contracting with anybody on that list. Keep your internal controls in place. You're still required to document the rationale for the purchase. You're still required to perform cost analysis. Again, if you're gonna use a non-competitive option, you still have to document which exemption you're using, still have required contract provisions. All of the procurement rules still apply, except for potentially if your federal agency adopted it, geographical preferences and the disadvantaged business program. Please keep that in mind and, and maintain your strong control environment over procurement. Okay, the last topic that we would like to talk about or that we see that there will be um, specific challenges is in the area of subrecipient monitoring. And from the nonprofit perspective, this is both from the perspective of you being a potential subrecipient. Uh, whether that's through the pass-through funds through the state or county or city, or potentially you as the nonprofit 
have subrecipients. And so right now what we're seeing the challenges being is that in the current environment, there's really low level of oversight. And that's really because no one knows the rules. Everyone's struggling um, to get the money out to where it needs to be. No one has real guidance at this point on what they can or can't be used for. We do envision that changing. Um, we think that there will be uh, some level of oversight exercised in the future to make sure that you use the funds for their intended purpose. And so it's much easier now to uh, be on top of your game and get your documentation and your systems in order than try to scramble three months from now and recreate your documentation. Grantors are really unsure of what to ask for from their subrecipients at this point. And we also have the challenges of the remote workforce. Um, how are they going to get the information um, submitted? Um, is there a secure method of getting their uh, reimbursement requests and the support um, to the granting agencies? Um, scanning capabilities, emergency situations, all of those things are challenges that we acknowledge. Now, if you are the organization or government be doing the monitoring of a subrecipient, there's expectations about performing risk assessments of your subrecipients. Do you have an understanding of the internal control changes that your subrecipients um, have had to make during this time frame? And what have you done in your risk assessment to address those internal control uh, changes? In a normal situation, if you have high risk subrecipients, you are supposed to increase your level of monitoring. Uh, well, that in itself is a challenge in the current situation. So again, documenting whether you're checking in with them on the phone or Zoom or periodic check-ins, um, you need to continue to monitor to the best of your ability, document what you've done to monitor them, provide them assistance, whether it's technical assistance or support to the best of your ability. You can't just pretend that the requirements are no longer um, applicable because it's too hard to do. Maybe now, um, if you are a nonprofit and you've never had to have a single audit, maybe you need to procure a single audit, or maybe your subrecipients previously were below the required threshold and now they will need a single audit. So again, those are all considerations that we acknowledge and realize are increasing the burden to your organizations. And, and just to kind of reiterate on some of the items that Joy just went over when, when we think about, you know, some of the subrecipient monitoring and the challenges, large dollar amounts, again, billions and billions of dollars, you know, there's the potential that maybe $500 billion are going to be dispersed to um, states, local governments, et cetera, in the upcoming weeks. And when we're talking about those type of dollars, many of that is much of that is going to flow through to subrecipient agencies, right? Because that's that's what makes sense. So, in a time like that, now is now is the time to really make sure your risk assessment policies are solid. And I'm not necessarily talking about risk assessment from the idea of funding. I'm talking about risk assessment from the backside in the monitoring. So. You know, on-site visits may not be a possibility in the current environment. What type of monitoring, how many, what support are you going to ask for? How many transactions are you going to ask for? A hundred percent, maybe that's too much volume. Maybe you can only ask for 40 or 60 or whatever that number is. Do, and, and you know your subrecipients best, some of those organizations may require a lot of monitoring, may some may require just a little bit of monitoring depending on 
their uh, grant compliance environment at that organization. You know, just because they have a staff of two or three doesn't necessarily mean they're higher risk if they're all very qualified and have a history of, of being compliant, but you need, to, you need to look at the operational environment of your subrecipients and really go through a risk assessment um, process to determine how much monitoring you need to do. Remember, you can't, you can't escape monitoring, you can't do zero, so you have to do a minimum level to ensure that there's um, reasonable assurance of compliance, but those levels and that reasonable assurance will vary by subrecipient. So if you, if you haven't implemented risk assessment policies for monitoring yet, um, now would be the time to really start examining that and, and coming up with something that makes sense. Again, you know, I have a couple of clients to where they have maybe one employee monitoring 50 subrecipients, and maybe that was possible in the past because of certain volume levels or the activities, but now those 50 subrecipients may turn into 80 subrecipients, and those 80 subrecipients, now maybe all of them need single audit or a majority of them need single audit, and there's a huge increase in burden on that. Also in a time when governments are gonna be facing budget cuts and, and realities about um, salary freezes or um, you know, having available positions to even carry out the work. And so that will interplay and, and, and go directly with risk assessment because if you have a good risk assessment policy, then you can start thinking about your burden that you're gonna have and, and then start looking at if job duties need to be reassigned and who needs to be monitoring what to ensure um, you know, appropriate compliance. Again, we're expecting a large increase in single audits, we're expecting an increase in findings. Um, who knows what's gonna happen with those internal control findings during the COVID um, pandemic, but we're still expecting a lot of, a uh, lot of findings, a lot of uh, question costs, a lot of issues, you know, things like the indirect costs with PPP and double dipping. We're expecting that a lot. And as a pass-through entity, you have to provide management decisions. So you need to be understanding uh, this information. If you have questions, you know, reach out to people, reach out to grantors, reach out to your I'd, I'd Bailey representatives and, and really start getting ahead of this. Again, remember the ultimate responsibility is the stewardship of the grant funds and make sure that they're doing public good and achieving the grant objectives. So just keep that in mind as you work through this. It's, it's all a partnership. It's all meant, um, everybody's meant to work together to, to carry out the objectives. So again, keep that in mind as you go through that. And with that, I will turn it over to Angie for closing, and then I'm assuming we have a little bit of time after that for questions that have come through. All right, thank you, Kurt and Joy, for all that great information that you provided to the group. Um, you know, a few thoughts as we kind of wrap this all up and think about next steps. Um, the big thing to remember, I think, unfortunately, as you leave here today, is that everything that we've talked about is really a big question mark. There is a lot of information going back and forth between the AICPA and the Office of Management and Budget and our federal authorities and the SBA, and every day there is new information that is coming out that helps to clarify an earlier position create a new position, answer some questions, results in a few more questions. And so we are going to be closely monitoring all of these changes as they come through the pipeline to make sure that we can provide you all with information as timely as possible. Um, but this is the information we talked about today are some really great first steps to make sure you've considered and have in place um, because you know, if things progress as they are now, uh, that you'll need to have single audits over these funds and, um, you know, that will be kind of status quo as federal funds, this is all stuff that you will need to have addressed. So, you know, it's, it's important to remember that this is ever changing, but also that there are some ground rules, typically with accepting federal dollars that maybe will not change. 
Um, you know, another thing kind of to take away from here is that communication with the federal grantors is really going to be key to make sure that you're managing those federal dollars in a manner that the grantors would expect. I know that right now is a challenging time to get through to them. Uh, we've had some agencies that are very responsive to our questions and some that um, are really radio silence right now. So just keep trying, log those questions when you have them. And if all else fails and you're not able to get through, you know, really probably have to stick to the letter of the grant agreement um, for, you know, to, to drive those questions. We are here to help in whatever way we can. So even though we might not have the answers for you right away, um, we, like I said, are, you know, we really have our boots to the ground on this and are trying to stay on top of all of the changes and can certainly try to work through your specific scenarios with you as you have questions. So we wanted to also provide you with a number of resources that you might find helpful. Um, we, a lot of the information that we are able to point our fingers to has come from a couple of specific um, memos that were released by the Office of Management and Budget. A lot of great information within these documents that kind of, you know, can point you in certain directions about double dipping and um, whether or not you can continue to pay employees even though they're not in the office working. Um, so, you know, certainly look to those links for some information. We also have provided you an information um, to on the CARES Act for state and local governments. So some information provided by Treasury that dives into the, the CARES Act in greater detail for those entities. We wanted to make sure you had a copy of the questions that the AICPA posed to the Office of Management and Budget because this really is kind of as soon as these questions are answered, a lot of what we're waiting on, um, you know, to really develop our approach for our upcoming audits will be answered by these questions. And then finally, uh, the Ig Bailey website has a bunch of information on it on publications that have been um, sent out to our clients, both on the for-profit front and the not-for-profit front. Um, single audits, you know, everything that we've pushed out, we have available on the IBE Daily website. So please visit that for a lot of great information. We did have a lot of questions come through the Q&A feature. And um, so that we can be sure that we answer each of these questions in a thorough manner, um, we're going to be responding individually to each of the questions. So please look for a response for, from us within the next few days. Um, our, the Zoom platform allows us to register kind of the email address and the person asking the question, so we'll be able to get those responses back to you. Again, I want to thank Kurt and Joy for their time here today. And um, as Amy mentioned at the beginning, if you completed all the polling questions and qualified for CPE, we will be emailing those CPE certificates out to you um, within 14 days. So thank you all for joining us today.